Well, hello, Free Methodist Church Can of uh, Canada, Free Methodist Church of Canada family. Uh, th- welcome to the very last Sunday of 2020. And all God's people say, woohoo. But before we say woohoo, uh, we need to acknowledge this year. We need to acknowledge what it is that we've learned, what it is we've been through, what it is that has uh, impacted our lives this year. So we're going to do that in prayer. And then we're going to transition ourselves into a place that says, Father, we look forward now to 2021. What would you have for us and how are we going to prepare for it? So that's a little bit of what this morning is all about. Would you you pray with me? So Father, we acknowledge that uh, 2020 was um, disquieting, disorienting. It was a difficult year for us, for the world. And we learned a lot about ourselves. We had an opportunity, Father, to understand our lives in a different way. We've seen things that are shortcomings in us. We've also seen resiliency. We've also seen opportunity. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us over the next, well, from now on, to acknowledge that this is now part of our fabric, 2020. It's impacted us, and we have an opportunity to learn from it, to grow from it. So here's us saying thank you for it. And now, Father, as we move into this time together, prepare our hearts, quiet our hearts. Help us to be in step with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, everyone, and Merry Christmas from the Seabirds here in Saskatoon. We know that this hasn't been the easiest year, uh, but we're really uh, grateful and excited that we get to share uh, this season together in this unique way. We pray God's richest blessings on you in 2021. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, we hope you had a a Merry Christmas. It's good to be here with uh, our Free Methodist family this morning. It is very nice to be with you and We pray that your Christmas and holiday celebrations have been really special this year. Um, We know that there, or we expect that they weren't uh, as you would have imagined or planned how they would be. But we pray that you, uh, during these times, have experienced some relaxation, uh, refreshing, renewal, and joy that um, comes with this season. And as we head into 2021, Our prayer for you has been that uh, you would experience as you head into the new year uh, the promise of the first Christmas, and that is God is with us, and that you would know that and understand that, and that we would all live our lives in response to that. I don't know what 2021 holds. You don't know what 2021 holds, but uh, our prayer is that we would experience God's peace and joy and hope, and that we would share that with the world around us. So from our family to our Free Methodist family. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Thanks everyone.
Let's take a moment to pray together. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, God, with us. If there was ever a year we needed you, it was 2020. We praise you for the hope you have brought us through this season. The hope knowing that you were there for us and that in all of this, you are not surprised. We confess that there are moments when we wonder. We confess there are moments when we're afraid. But I'm so thankful that your love casts out all fear. Help us to remember your faithfulness. Help us to remember your promises that we have experienced in the past and the promises that you've given us for the future in your word. We pray for Canada. We pray for the many people across our nation who are facing problems and hurt, financial stress, anxiety, possible loss from this year. We lift them up to you as brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for healing for many who are broken physically and emotionally. And we pray for our churches across this country as they continue to come up with creative ways to reach in and to help heal their communities, to reach in and be the hands and feet of Jesus. We pray for our government and ask that you would continue to put the people in place who are listening to you, who are listening for your voice and how to move forward in this crisis. We continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Sri Lanka, thanking you for them, thanking you for their courage, thanking you for the love that they show for you to their communities. We pray a blessing on Sri Lanka. Help us not to respond in anger to the anger that's in our culture, fill us with your love because your love has taught us that out of fear, love cannot exist. And you are perfect love. Would you help us to love our communities through our churches? Thank you so much for your all encompassing love for us. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. When fear like waves are crashing on the shore Steady 
Where is your God? That's what they're asking me. And I'm wondering too. This cloud won't lift. I've been choking on these tears. My soul is parched for you. I remember sunshine. I remember laughter. I remember happy crowds. We shouted praise to you. Then. Why am I so discouraged? I must not surrender to it. I will hope in you. Your love guides me through. I know. I hear your song in the darkness. Do you hear my prayer? I have no other savior. You're the God of my life. My only one. Once I swam in you like an ocean. Do you remember? Cuz I can't forget. This fog, this fog will pass. Your sun, it will shine. But I won't wait. I'll praise you. I will praise you. Here. Thank you, Carleen. Let me just start with uh, shameless self-promotion. Actually, a uh, free Methodist promotion. One of the ways that we stay connected as a church family is with Cliff Notes. You heard some things in the announcements about New Leaf and church health, but here is one more way. Every Tuesday, uh, I send out what uh, my team calls Cliff Notes, and I, I like the name. Anyway, that is a way for you to hear what's going on with your brothers and sisters across Canada. You subscribe by going um, onto the website and you'll see my picture at the bottom of the screen and you can subscribe there. So the question I'm asking as, uh, as I think through 2020, 2020, I, I, I wonder what we were prepared for. What, what in the world were we prepared for coming into this year? Were we prepared for a, a crisis? I think about Jesus and how he prepared or discipled his disciples. And he, uh, he was very intentional about preparation. He said things like, if you want to be a, a follower of mine, then you need to take up your cross and follow me daily. This would have been unusual for them to hear because he hadn't gone to the cross yet. So what they were hearing is, uh, if you want to be my follower, then you need to take up this executioner, uh, this ex execution a brutal execution uh, instrument and you need to follow me they would have been hearing from him unusual words but they knew there was a severity about his words um, a, a grittiness about being a follower something about life and death about being a follower he prepared them by saying things like uh, so they if they hated me you know you know they're going to hate you too or things like um you want to be my follower, then you need to sell everything you have and, and follow me. Again, this, this radicalness, this grittiness, this severity. Paul, the apostle, um, he understood Jesus' preparation, Jesus' teaching. And uh, he all but said, bring it on. You know, he, he said things like, uh, uh, um, I count it all joy, you know, to be persecuted. For the sake of Christ or with Christ. He, he was all but saying, bring it on. Whatever the worst is that you can bring my way, bring it on. Because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I'm the church. And as I was thinking about us, the church in 2020. I, I just never heard any of us, any of the church leaders say things like, bring it on 2020. Whatever you got. Bring it on and you'll see how resilient the church is how creative we are, how entrepreneurial we are. You'll see church, the world will see the church as this, this force, this shining light that's going to help move us through whatever happens that is not good in 2020. We, we didn't use that type of language. 
Because I'm not sure that's how we were prepared. I, uh, I travel a lot in the work that I do here in Canada and abroad. And over and over, I hear myself have this conversation with Carlene. We'll, we'll leave a church, one of your churches, and, uh, and she'll, we'll say, what, what just happened and, to each other? And we both acknowledge, boy, those were really good people. I really, I could see myself staying in that church, you know? And, and they love Jesus. Over and over, Carlene and I have said those very words. Or I'll call her after an event and I'll say, boy, I'm just with just really nice people, good people. And they really love Jesus. That, I think that's how we've prepared ourselves. I think as I understand the church and our discipleship model over what, however many years in Canada and the United States as we've prepared people to be really nice people who love Jesus. Now, the question is, how can we prepare better for crises like the one we've just been through? How can we be that resilient, that kind of creative, that kind of entrepreneurial, that kind of shining light that, uh, that people just are drawn to in times like what we've just been through? Because there'll be others. We're not even out of this one yet. We, um, we are moving into a strange new season. I, I've been reading a little bit about what futurists are predicting or wondering about. For instance, technology, driverless cars and implications for us. Um, I don't know if you've seen the movie yet or the documentary Social Dilemma, but I, uh, I, I'm sure that won't win movie of the year or documentary of the year, but I think it, would, um, I think it will uh, create some conversation opportunities for your family, for your church family, for your small group. It, it's worth watching. Technology. There's this shift in Christendom, where for at least a hundred and some years now, uh, Canada and the United States, mostly the states, has defined what Christianity can look like. The style of worship, the, the form that we are in, the, even theology, uh, has been really, really formed by North America. But that's shifting. The majority of Christians are not here. The majority of um, the money and the, um, the, the power or um, uh, um, opportunity is not here in North America. It's in Asia and Africa. And they are going to be front runners in defining an I the identity of Christendom. There'll be implications for us. Or China. I was reading a very interesting article about China. Maybe you've seen some of that. Unapologetically and unashamedly, they're saying, here's our agenda for the world in the next 10 to 15 years. And they're on track. They will be a world power, um, the world power. There'll be implications in culture and in how the church needs to shift. So I, 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 I'm thinking we should put a re push a reset button. You know that word reset? Our, our, our prime minister has used it. Conspiracy theorists have used it. Uh, and maybe it's a good word for you. Maybe it's not. I'd like to use it in a good way. A church reset. A self-examination that says, where, where could we start? I'd say in these four areas are, are most interesting to me. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in each of these, but I hope there's conversation starters for us. We have a Sunday morning centricity about us in the church in North America, maybe around the world still, where the church is defined by how we do church on Sunday morning. Our health is dependent, or we understand or score ourselves according to the number of people that sit in a pew on a Sunday morning. Our budgets are reflective of this centricity. Uh, how we write our pastor's job descriptions. Pastors, how we understand ourselves all have a lot to do with one hour on a Sunday morning. And I think we've missed the boat on this one. I think it's an opportunity now to reset. Sunday mornings will continue to be important as a corporate worship time, but it should not be our identity. It should not be the driving force of our budgets or uh, uh, the key measure of our health. I think that's a conversation. The second is discipleship. Uh, how we do this one-on-one, -on -one, how do we train each other, how do we understand even the definition of discipleship? I think right now it's, I hope it's happening in our sermons, in our Sunday school if we have them, and in our small groups if I go. That's kind of how we do small group, uh, discipleship. But there was never a time the disciples stopped being discipled or disciples. And Jesus 24-7 
for three years invested into the lives of these, uh, these men. And, and that's our opportunity too. What does discipleship look like? There should be no loneliness, no emptiness in relationship in the church if we understood discipleship properly. The third is peace. That has to be cornerstone to how we do things. Peace and hope together are um, they're, they're partners in, in, in our understanding of who... They should be cornerstone to what we do. Peace, shalom of God, is not only what we receive from God, that sense of wholeness, of joy, of contentment, but it's also what we bring. And there's never been a season that I have been alive in where us being peace bringers is more important. You know, in the, the tensions that exist between people groups, it should be us, church, that steps up and steps into these with peace. We should not be creating more polarization. For sure, you have every right to have a vote. You have every right to have an opinion about politics, but to be quite frank, so did the Apostle Paul have that right. He was a Roman citizen. He had every right to vote and to... To, uh, to speak what he felt was right or wrong with regard to the oppressive Roman government and his people. And we have none of that in his teaching. He chose, first of all, to be a citizen of the kingdom. He chose, first of all, to be all things to all people. And if his opinion about Rome and the oppression was going to make it so that he would not have audience with Romans, then he chose not to do that. I'm calling our church into peace, peacemaking, peace bringers, because really this is, this is our job. The tensions that exist, this is our work. One of our task forces, a new one, the, uh, the anti-racism task force, they're coming up with a better name, by the way. Um, their job is to help us to lean into what it is to be peace bringers and makers. The last one is hope, and I, I'd like to linger here just a little bit. Hope is that opportunity that we bring to others. Everybody has some idea. We use the hope, word hope all the time. In fact, you want some homework? Ask your friends at work that are not churched, what's hope? What's the definition of hope? They're likely to use the word wish in their, in their uh, answer. But I was thinking here, this would, be, uh, this would be one way to describe hope versus wish. Um, do you know what this is? This uh, is a $20 bill. We used to use these before uh, e-transfer and debit cards. They, and they used to mean something a little bit more. $20 bill in my day was worth something. $20 bill in an economy that just prints a whole lot of bills is not worth a whole lot. So I was thinking of Argentina. They, they print a whole lot of bills. And, and uh, in fact, I think it costs about 37 pesos, 37 bills, in order to buy a loaf of bread, for instance. And what happened is they print more bills than what they have in the reserves and what it is backed by, these bills. So this money then is not backed by anything, so it's not worth anything. But they keep printing it. In Canada, the, the dollar is backed by, um, by the Bank of Canada and uh, the Canadian people. Bank of Canada is backed by gold reserves. So this is backed by something. And we're only supposed to print as many of these as we have the backing for. Hope is backed. Wishes aren't backed. Wishes are wishes upon a star. Wishes, I hear people say things like you can will something into existence, so let's wish it. But there's no power in that. There's no hope. There's no control. There's... But hope, on the other hand, it's backed. We have a confident hope in God, a confidence expectation that what God says he will do because he's already said things and they've happened, always according to the way he said them. And so this is our hope, this hope or this opportunity to, to, uh, to say here, uh, I am confident that I'm able to bring this to you, love or forgiveness or a sense of direction or peace because God said so. And it's him that's backing these words. Church, people need hope. And that's what we can bring. This is the currency we can spend. We can be peace bringers, peacemakers, and bring hope into people's lives. 
Let me show you. Let me end with Psalm 42. Psalm 42 looks like this guy, the psalmist, is, uh, is dealing with a COVID season. And here's the refrain. It's mentioned two times, this refrain, f- refrain in verses 5 and 11. So let me start there. Why my soul, why my whole being, are you feeling downcast? Why are you so disturbed in me? So what you're hearing the psalmist say is that there's this inner turmoil. There's something real going on inside him. And then he, it's not good. Sounds like COVID season. And then there's this resolve, almost as if his posture changes. So why are you downcast? Why is this struggle going on? And then put your hope in God. The psalmist speaking to himself in prayer, hearing and remembering what it is that he has that is backed, the currency that he really is uh, for sure that is true about him. Put your hope in God. For I will praise him, my Savior and my God. It's, it's, that, it's, it's, it's him speaking his truth into his life. I have hope, and my hope is backed by God. It's currency that I have. But look at verses uh, 4 and 6. Here's the first one. This is, this is the psalmist's hope. So remember, this is a song. This is part, so we've read the refrain. We've just read the refrain. Here is a, so this is like a country song, right? It's kind of sad. And here, here's part of the refrain. Verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. So this is his wish. This is what's going on inside him. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. See what he's saying? He's saying that I want to get back to worship services. I remember worship services. And I long for those. That's his wish. Look at verse, um, look at verse 6. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, and, and from Mount Mizar. Here, he's remembering his home. He remembers where he comes from. Almost translate that into Canada, 2020, and you're hearing, I, rem- I remember the grandkids coming over, or the kids coming over. I remember being free to go out to Walmart without having to put a mask on. I remember not living in fear, like I had back in the day. That's his wish. The psalmist is describing his wishes, and he has no control over these wishes. No control at all, actually, That's because that's what a wish is. It's something that you long for. It's something good that you want. But like unbacked currency, there's nothing to it. There's just a wish. There's just a hope that doesn't have any backing. And then he comes to his refrain, and he reminds them himself, actually. Um, I hope in God. My hope is backed by God. His promises to me. So I can hope um, and I can bring this currency of hope to the bank. I can buy groceries with this hope that I have. I can bring it to my neighbor and offer them hope. I can offer hope because it's backed by God. Hope of forgiveness. Hope of love. Hope of peace. We're moving into uh, 2021. And uh, it feels like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, eh? We're talking vaccine, and, and for some of us, that'll be something else that you're going to, there'll be sides, vaccine or not vaccine. Again, I'm calling you to peace. But into 2021, church, I want you to lean in to have conversations about what is it for us to be a people of peace? Not only to have received it, but also, Father, what is it for us to bringers of peace in our community? Because there's polarization for sure. And hatred for sure. And tensions for sure. What is it for us to offer peace and hope? We have this currency, this hope backed by God. What is it for us to be bringers of hope? We're about to have difficult conversations and, and uh, make decisions about who we are and what the church will look like. And they will go well if we are learning what it is to be people of peace and bringers of hope. Let me pray. Father, I thank you, first of all, for the Free Methodist Church in Canada. Good people that love you. And I'm so proud to be a part of this church family. 
And we're asking you at the end of this year, and moving into next year, for uh, you to, Father, uh, prepare us. Prepare us in such a way that we've learned from what we've been through. And now, Father, to be the people that you've called us to be. A people that would stand like Paul and say, bring it on, 2021. And we will be resilient church. And we will be creative church. An entrepreneurial church. And not a lone church. A church that brings peace and hope. So, Father, would you give us that kind of courage, that kind of resolve. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, at the end of 2020, we, uh, Carlene and I, want to wish you um, a very happy new year. I want to do better than happy. Can we do that? Can we do better Hopeful. than happy? Hopeful new year. Peaceful new year. Rich with God new year. Happy new year. Happy new year.